Well, hey, everybody, welcome to Oasis Church Online. It's great that you guys tuned in today. Hey, just want to let you know that hey, now that the, the fall season is definitely here, you maybe have shut down your cabin. Uh, this is a great time to start some new uh, programs like our next steps, our life groups, and our serving teams. Uh, but hey, if you live far away from the Winnipeg area, um, um, this is a great time to, if you ever you are in the Winnipeg area, uh, we have a seat for you in this space here, as well as for your students, as well as for all your kids in elementary school. So uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit later. And we're starting a brand new series today called Reason to Believe. And we'll see you back here in just a moment. Well, hey everybody, happy Sunday. Welcome to Oasis Church. It's awesome you guys are here today. My name is Wes. I'm part of the staff team here at Oasis. And whether you are with us in this room with us or whether you're watching online, special welcome to you. And hey, as we get going, I just wanna let you know, we know that life is hard and we wanna help you with anything that life throws your way. So if you're wondering what to expect today, we're gonna to be here together for about one hour. We're gonna sing some songs and we are starting a brand new series today called Reason to Believe. And our lead pastor, Dustin, he's gonna be coming to speak about halfway through the service. Uh, just to let you know about a couple things before we get going. Um, we know that there's new people here every Sunday and if, you, if that's you and if you're wondering how to get involved, what are the best way for me to get connected here? Uh, that's what we call, that's what would be our next steps. And that's primarily our life groups and our serving teams. This is the, the best way to get connected here and make a big church uh, feel small. So like we always do every Sunday, we're gonna start off by singing some songs together. And this first song that we're gonna sing is called Here For You. And, and it says that God, um, to you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire. And in James chapter four, verse eight, it says, when we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. And we have an opportunity right now to sing these songs together. I'm gonna to encourage you to do that today. So I wanna invite you to stand up and join Kennedy and Chris and Lauren and Tim as we sing. Stand up and join us. Well, one of the greatest things about Sundays is we get to take the things that have consumed our weeks, stressed us out, and kind of intentionally lay them aside and focus on God and who He is. And so we're going to invite you to do that as we sing this first song together. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you.
Well, thanks for your singing so far. You can go ahead and take a seat. Uh, we're going to sing another song in just a moment. We just wanted to pause with you just for a moment. Um, you know, I, um, I grew up in Winnipeg, and I went to public school uh, here. Um, so from kindergarten to grade six, every morning, uh, and some of you experienced too, that you know the principal would get on the intercom, uh, say some announcements, and then we'd hear three things. We'd hear, "O Canada, God save the Queen, and the Lord's Prayer. And so I heard the Lord's Prayer almost every day of my childhood. And I'm kind of wondering, through all those years, like how many times did I actually hear it? So I added it up. And um, I heard it approximately 1,351 times. And um, so I had it easily memorized, um, but just because I had it memorized, I didn't necessarily know uh, what it meant or what it, what it said. Maybe some of you can experience that too. You know, I just had some phrases, you know, like, thy kingdom come and forgive us our trespasses. And, I, and I'm thinking, it's like, well, I didn't go on anybody's property, so I think I'm good. And then when his disciples asked him, they said, hey, Jesus, uh, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus never said, this is how you should pray, but this is, this is, this is he, he said, this is how you should pray. And he went on to, to say, recite the, what we know as the Lord's Prayer. So this morning, I'd like to read you uh, just a version that you're likely maybe a little more unfamiliar with and where the wording is a little bit different. And, and maybe today this helps us bring some meaning to that. So I'm just going to invite you as I read this, the words are going to be on the screen just to contemplate this as I read this. Here it is. Our Father, who dwells in the heavens and on the earth, you are holy. May heaven be a greater present reality here on earth, and may we choose to join you in making that happen. Provide us today with the things that you think we need, and may we not take for granted that which you have already provided for us. For, forgive us for when we don't live as you intend, and may we be ready to forgive, other, forgive, forgive others when they don't live as we intend. Guide us in your wisdom away from the things that would distort us and restore the parts in us that are already distorted. You are goodness, beauty, and truth. May your love rule always. Amen. And this next song the band's going to sing, Just, we can declare some of those truths together. Join them as they sing.
song together. I'll invite you to stand and join us. Oh, love surpassing knowledge, your grace so full and free. I know that Jesus saves me, and that's enough for me. Oh, wonderful salvation, from sin he makes me free. And I feel the sweet assurance, and that's enough for me. much for singing with us. You can take a seat. Well, right now we have an opportunity to, to continue our worship through giving. Um, and um, if um, we, we have an app that we can, you can use, it's a great time to use it now. Also take advantage of the, this drop boxes on your way or this digital giving stations out in the foyer. 
And hey, if you're a guest here with us today, please don't feel obligated to participate in this part of the service. Um, we really hope that we really receive from being here today. So this service is our gift to you. Uh, for Oasis, for the Oasis uh, family members, I want you to let you know about uh, two weeks ago, we had probably the largest student retreat that uh, uh, we've done ever, uh, where there's about 240 students and leaders that went to Camp Arnest for the weekend. And this is what it looked like here. It, this was an incredible time for, for these students just to be learning to build relationship and just some incredible life-changing moments. And when we do these events, these, there's a cost to these. And, um, but we really believe that it's, it's, this investment is so worth it. It's these life-anchoring moments, these life-anchoring experiences that these students uh, got to experience. And I, 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 had, I had three kids of my own at this tree, and they just came back with just story after story. And I was so grateful that uh, we can create these life-changing uh, experiences in potentially these students' lives when they're maybe the most chaotic times of their lives. And we do these things all in hopes that when circumstances come about in their lives where they may drift away from their faith, they will anchor, they'll, they'll be able to be anchored so deeply that when they drift, they'll only be able to drift so far. And when you give here, you're part of every one of these life-changing stories. So we're going to give you an opportunity to do that now. Thanks so much for your giving. Nothing, just cleaning up a little. So, hey, I grew up singing that song. Uh, maybe you did too. Uh, this is a series about how I think that song still has so much legitimacy and how you can keep singing that. And if you didn't grow up around the Bible, why the Bible, why Christianity, I think, is so trustworthy. And so we're starting a new series today, and this is about answers to some of the tough questions that we get about our faith, living when and where we do. And sometimes we've unfortunately received Sunday school answers to tough questions. And so this is going to be my best attempt to give you some answers to this. And my goal for the series is that you'd see that the Bible and that Christianity is respectable. Because sometimes people say, like, how could you ever believe that? I hope you see it's respectable. It's believable. I think what we're going to look at makes more sense of our world than some of the messages we're given. But this word's so important that it's desirable. That even if you're here and maybe you just got invited, invited because someone promised you lunch, uh, you'd say that, man, I hope that's true, that Christianity is desirable. I think it offers, Christianity offers some unique resources living when and where we do the cultural moment that we're in. So just a few words. This series is going to be a little bit philosophical. That's okay. Okay, it's worshiping God with our mind. And some of you um, don't send me emails. Okay, we're going to get to the Bible each week, but I want you to see how desirable what the Bible teaches is. So each week I kind of have to present to you 
what our world tells us about different messages and uh, where that leads us before we get to the good news. Okay, so that's how this is going to look because in so many ways, we are being taught a belief system regarding so many different areas, regarding meaning and where our purpose, why we're here. Are we here for a purpose? Regarding, is there any hope? regarding happiness and, and satisfaction in life, regarding justice. Uh, one of the messages we get is, you know, regarding our freedom. It's just that everyone should be free to do whatever they want to do as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. And we're going to look at this series. We're going to say, does that work? How, how do, where does that lead us? Is there a better way? And the thing about these messages is that they're stated as givens, right? They come to us in movies or in social media, and it's just like, of course this is what you do. And this series is about the idea that Christianity has better resources for you. I think it makes more sense of the world we live in. And if you want to follow along, um, I want to give credit here. There's a book called Making Sense of God by a guy named Tim Keller. He just passed away recently. Phenomenal book. It had such an impact on me. And, and so most of this are his ideas and um, ideas from supporting resources around that that I'm teaching. And we've ordered a number more copies of that book. If you want to grab that at the bookstore, they know you're coming. And so this has just been such a helpful uh, bit of resources for me that I wanted to share them with you. And so here's the weeks of these series. Um, in uh, two weeks, we're going to look at this idea that you, you need happiness in life. You need happiness that's bigger than just changing circumstances. Um, next week, we're going to look at this idea that you need a meaning in life. You need a purpose that's resilient enough to face suffering. All of us, this is a broken world. This is going to affect your life. It's going to affect every one of our lives. You need a purpose that's big enough to help you get through that. You need a way to determine what's right and wrong in life and how do I make choices and dilemmas. You need some sort of hope for the future. Is there any hope? And no matter what your belief system is, no matter what worldview you have, you have to have these things to function as a human being. Today, I want to look at the concept of identity. And you need an identity that's strong enough to handle the ups and downs of your performance and how well you perform to, to, to the standards in your life. Now, when we talk about identity, we're talking about a sense of self. How do we think about ourselves? And we're talking about a sense of worth, right? How valuable we are. And, um, excuse me, in our culture, um, identity is maybe at the core of our culture, right? Because we're told every day we get messages that says, you got to be true to yourself. You know, you got to love yourself. You got to value yourself. Our culture is obsessed with identity. And every culture, every single culture has to give its members a way of forming their identity, about forming who, who am I? How do I think about myself? What's my value? You can't live without that. And so what I want to do today in this message, we're going to look at... Um, how does our culture do that? What's the modern way of saying, this is how you think about yourself. I want to compare and contrast that to the traditional way of thinking about identity. And if you, a lot of members of our church, uh, you were born in Africa or you were raised in Latin America or Asia, chances are you were raised in a traditional form of, of identity. You see if you recognize that. But then what I really want to do is, what does Christianity have to offer? I think it offers us a better way. So we're going to get there. There's a really interesting writer named uh, Charles Taylor. He's a philosopher, and he wrote a book called Sources of the Self. And the subtitle is The Making of the Modern Identity. And he contrasts the way for thousands of years, the traditional form, for lack of a better word, the traditional way we kind of thought of ourselves and made our identities versus the modern way. And there's a great summary of it where he says this, that the traditional way of forming identity is outside in. And so in traditional cultures, the way you thought of yourself or built an identity of who you were was you went outside yourself to find truth, and then you brought it inside, and you align your life to that truth. And the truth could be God, or it could be um, a tradition, it could be your family. Every culture is a little different. So an example of this would be a lot of traditional cultures have uh, some sort of command that says, honor your parents, right? And so... Um, your parents own a business and they want you to stay in that business and you know, you're a farmer or you're a baker or whatever it is and you have dreams of being an actor or whatever, going to the big city but you know, traditional identity says you gotta conform. So that's what you do. You give up on your dreams and you align to what your family wants to do. You honor your parents and then your, your worth is given to you or bestowed upon you by your parents or by your community usually based on how well you align to that. Now please realize the modern way to form an identity is the exact opposite of this. It is inside out. And so what our culture says, here's how you think about who you are. First, you got to look inside. you got to decide, this is who I want to be. Find what the truth is. And whatever you say you are, you are. 
And then you go outside and you demand that everyone else accept that and demand that everyone else accommodate to what you've decided. That's the modern identity. And in the modern way of making identity, no one has the right to tell you your self-worth except you. You are your own validator. You decide what's right and wrong for you. You don't give your family that power. You validate yourself. So, summary, traditional identity is outside in. Modern identity is inside out. Some of you probably recognize both of those immediately because you're raised by traditional parents, but you're living in a modern world, right? And so please realize this. Here's what I need you to understand. Our culture never says, hey, there are many ways of forming identity. This is just imposed upon you as a given. It's uh, This is how you do it. Like, everyone knows that. It's invisible. And so let me give you some examples of this. Um, <clears throat> J.K. Rowling in her book, um, and now it's a movie, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. It's a narrative about obscurials. And an obscurial is a wizard that, for whatever reason, is not being allowed to do magic, not being allowed to express their magical nature that's inside them. And if you are not able to express your nature, then you're an obscurial and you produce an obscurus. And I had to look this up, but what's an obscurus? It's a dark parasitical magic force that goes around eating things like a huge amoeba. So pro tip, don't be an obscurial, right? And the point, what's the message, right? The point is, hey, if you can't express what's inside you, that's terrible. There's gonna be terrible side effects. Um, the, um, speaking of movies, in 1964, Walt Disney released the original Mary Poppins. And, and I was, I, this was on TV when I was a kid. I watched that movie a number of times. Some of you are old enough to see it in the theater. But um, now, 50 years later, they've released a newer one, right? And uh, the first Mary Poppins was all about Mr. Banks. And Mr. Banks had these incredible dreams of what he wanted to achieve in life, right? And these goals. He wanted to be wealthy. He wanted to advance. And there's a song in the movie called A Man Has Dreams of Walking with Giants. But he's so busy in his job at the banks. You see what they did there, right? He's Mr. Banks. He works at the bank, okay? Um, but at the end, he feels guilty, and he quits his job, and he goes and flies kites with his kids. And that's the traditional identity, right? The traditional identity says your family is more important than your dreams, so conform to that. The latest Mary Poppins, and we don't have time to go into it, but it's totally opposite. It's now a message of self-expression and self-discovery, and uh, the actor Glenn Close, when she won the Golden Globe, she actually recently got up and said, you know, family's great, but you got to put your career first. You got to do your own thing first, which is the exact opposite of the traditional identity. Now, those are two examples, but the best example, many of you have seen the best example, and the most known example is in the movie Frozen, right? And the signature song in the movie Frozen is... Let it go. Yeah. Now, have you ever listened to the lyrics of Let It Go? This is how it starts. It says, don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal. Don't feel. Don't let them know. No, that is the traditional identity being depicted in the most brutal and repressive of terms, right? Be the good girl you have to be. It's this traditional identity that says you got to conform to society's standards. But then suddenly she sings, I've got to see what I can do. Test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong. No rules for me. I'm free. Let it go. And she's moving right before your eyes from a traditional to a modern identity. And if you didn't get it, there's a costume change and the hair comes out, you know. Um, and it's a catchy song, right? It's, it's a powerful animation. But what it's saying is, right, hey, if to, you got to know who you are, you got to express what's inside of you. And the point of this is simply what I'm saying is that those are the ways our culture imposes upon us. This is how you build a sense of self. It's invisible. It's in movies. And I want to talk about the severe problems of the modern identity. But let me just say this. I'm not here to make a case for the traditional identity either. Um, I hope, stay with me till the end, okay, when we talk about the gospel. But I think all of us look back in our families, and um, if, if maybe your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents were very happy that they left these very traditional forms of making identity. They left the old country where, you know, you have to be a shoemaker because your parents were shoemakers and your grandparents and your great, you know, and, and now we get to choose um, in Canada what we do for a living. And so the traditional identity, I get it, it can suffocate, it can lead to exploitation, but there also are some severe problems with the way we are being told in our society, the modern way to build your identity. And here's the first one. It is incoherent. It actually doesn't make sense if you think about it, and here's why. The modern identity says, hey, look inside yourself. Define who you are. And if you're honest with yourself and you do that, you realize that our deepest desires contradict. A very simple example of that, we're all a little like Mr. Banks, right? Where 
I want to have my family look a certain way and tuck my kids into bed and pizza night, Friday nights, Friday night pizza nights, you know, and vacations. But then I also want my career to go a certain way. And I want prestige and I want a certain pay. And for some of you, it's a very real choice where if you, you know, are at every one of your kids' games, you're not going to sell as much as the other people that want promotions, right? And, there's a, and it's just, it's a simple example of one of the one million ways that our heart, the desires of our heart, if we're honest, they move in different directions and our deepest desires contradicts. And it is totally incoherent. It's totally muddled to say, oh, just look inside yourself and define who you are. And even if for a brief period of time, everything aligns, and you can say, yes, this is who I am. Just wait a week, okay? Wait a while, and it'll change. There's a British writer who said this so well. His name's Francis Spufford, and he said this. You're a being whose wants make no sense. Your desires deep down or discordantly arranged so that you truly want to possess and surely want not to possess at the same time. Isn't that true of us sometimes? I, I, I don't know what I want. St. Augustine, in his book, The Confessions, which we're going to come back to a few times in this series, says this. He said there was a time he was looking inside himself, and he said, myself is dispersed and scattered. My thoughts and desires do not form a coherent whole. I cannot find myself strictly by looking on the inside. And so what I'm trying to say here is just it, it doesn't work. Some of you have tried that. You say, I don't know who I am, right? But here's the other problem. Let's see if you agree with this. The modern identity is fragile. It is incredibly fragile. If we say to ourselves, hey, only you can validate yourself, it's not possible because we are relational creatures, irreducibly. We, are rela- we need the validation from the outside of someone to say, hey, you're good, or, or you're loved, right? It doesn't work to say, everyone thinks I'm a monster, but I don't care. I think I'm great, right? You do need outside validation, and if the problem is you say, I gotta validate myself, no one knows your own failures more than yourself, right? All of us, we, I don't even live with my own standards. And so this says, the problem with the modern identity is you can't validate yourself. It doesn't work. We need a word from the outside. We need someone else to say you're good, or, right? And so that makes the modern identity incredibly, incredibly fragile. We are the most needy group, needy people group ever in history where we need so much affirmation. We are so easily offended and you know, in the traditional form of identity, you made shoes and you're a, or you're a baker or whatever, and your community says, hey, you're good, and you feel affirmed. In modern, yeah, we're free, but we're free to feel constantly neurotic, constantly worried, constantly unstable. And am I enough? Is it good enough? Always needing affirmation, and it's never enough. And the way you see this fragility, if you disagree with me, just look on social media. Every day you see meltdowns where we can't disagree with people any longer because When someone expresses their idea, it's them, and it becomes part of their identity. And by disagreeing, you're attacking me, right? One of the ways this shows up is in young people. There's this incredible form of perfectionism where there was a study done just five years ago, 2018, of 40,000 college students in Canada, Britain, and um, America. This is the Journal of Psychological Review, and it said, millennials are suffering from perfectionism in many areas of their lives, setting unrealistically high expectations and feeling deep hurt and pain when they fall short. There's a workaholism about it. No matter how much we achieve, the cupboard's bare, right? It's just not enough. We, it's not enough to just say, I'm going to set my own standards and validate myself. And I'll share with you one other way that this shows up is it's so fragile. There's a book I've mentioned many times over the years. Is written by a guy named Ernest Becker. It's called The Denial of Death. It was written in 1974, I believe, and it won the Pulitzer Prize for the best book that year. But he's very honest. He says, now that we don't believe in God, are we free? He wasn't a Christian. He was just saying, this is the problem. Very honest. He says, "Uh, we have to look to other things to validate us. And he looks at this one time, how we look at romance to be this validator of our lives. Now that we don't have God, we need romance. And he says, now that we don't get our identity from God, We try to get our identity from a lover. The self-glorification that we now need to achieve in our innermost being, we now look for in our love partner. What is it that we want when we elevate the love partner to this position? We want the love partner to rid us of our faults. We want to be justified. We want to get rid of our feeling of nothingness. We want to know that our existence has not been in vain. We want redemption from our love partner. Needless to say, no human being can give you this, right? And and it makes us fragile because we're putting all of our eggs into the basket of the opinion of our lover. And and, and human beings are broken, right? It's fragile. Let me summarize it with one more quote, if you stick with me here. Maybe two more quotes, okay? But um, 
There's a guy named Freddie DeBoer. He teaches writing, and he, he summarized this so well. He's, um, he, see if this post captures where you have felt about what you've been told about how to build the, your identity in the modern world. He says, why is everybody I know such a wreck? We have this vast intellectual architecture telling us that physical attractive hierarchies are cruel, gendered, and unfair, and that's correct. But we still care about being hot. And we judge each other about it. And our papers and our humanity seminars are entirely inadequate to stop us doing that. We've got a political critique of the ways the notions of human worth are dictated by traditional inequalities of race and sex and class. We've got self-help culture that constantly counsels us that every one of us, you are a ray of brilliant, unique light that alone can shine away into the dark world. We've got a woke world of marketing that sells products by selling you yourself. See the gym ad down the street. Join the body acceptance movement. We've got our social media tools to craft and share perfectly idealized visions of ourself. And then he says this, and he says, and none of it works. And none of it works. I see people who are the most outwardly secure and confident, who never portray a hint of doubt or guilt or remorse, who project cool at all times, who are popular, getting applauded, who are academically and professionally successful, who have money and respect, and yet the flow of life reveals that inside they hate themselves. And none of that stuff seems to matter. None of it could get at the self-hatred within. And I'm wondering, is this the human condition? Right? What is he saying? Modern identity is fragile. It's incredibly fragile. And if you're basing it on your image, you're basing it on who you say you are, it's never going to be enough. Now, just really quickly, before we get to the good news, two points, two more points about why what we're being sold doesn't work about how to form an identity. And that one of them is that it's socially fragmented. And I won't go into too much detail, but if it's true that you, that, you know, no one, you always got to be true to yourself, it means that it leads us to this place where we so often only get into relationships if they're benefiting us. And all our relationships become transactional. And we become consumers in relationships. And if I'm in a relationship that's benefiting me, great. But if this isn't really helping me, I'm out of here if it doesn't meet my needs, right? And that's why one of the reasons why for, for people with a modern identity, parenting is so hard. There's a writer named Jennifer Senior, and she writes, this, she says, fewer and fewer people are having children. And here's the reason why it's so much more traumatic for us, and that's for modern people. She says this, parenting is the only non-transactional relationship left. You can't divorce your kids, it says. Um, And what she's saying is the modern identity is so self-focused that it makes relationships even hard. And Charles Taylor later wrote about this too, and he says that communities are eroding, families and neighborhoods Even the political process, people are less willing to participate. They're less trusting of any institution or any authority. It's harder and harder to build a society. What we're being sold doesn't work. And one last idea, not only is it socially fragmenting, but the modern identity is an illusion. Some of you are counselors and you're in counseling, so let me get very technical for a second before we move past this. But there's an interesting academic volume called Identity and Social Change, written by Joseph E. Davis, and he says this, In today's modern therapy, very often the therapist will say to his client, you must not let anyone tell you who you are. You must validate yourself. Then he goes on and he says, there's deep hypocrisy in this because in that very moment, the therapist is pushing a very particular Western, highly individualistic view of identity and reality on the patient in a major way and not giving him or her any choice at all and therefore the therapist is doing exactly what he or she has told the client. Don't let anyone do you. And so modern people say, hey, you're free, but we're not. We're being given a grid. We're saying, this is how you build your identity. And we're, we're following the script. And, and it doesn't work. It, it, it's fragmenting. It's an illusion. It, it doesn't make sense. It's fragile. And I think the loneliness rates in our society, which are off the charts, the suicide rates that are doubling and tripling, the uh, mental health statistics confirm we're not doing well. And so is there a way forward? Yes, there's an incredible way forward. But notice before we get to that, both the modern and the traditional identity, they're trying to justify themselves, right? In both these identities, they're trying to earn their salvation, so to speak. Consider the movie 
Chariots of Fire. Some of you saw this movie. It won Best Picture in the 80s. And uh, it's based on a true story. It's based on a true story of an athlete named Harold Abrahams who was a runner in the Olympics and he, he competed for gold in the 1924 Olympics, the 100-yard dash. And there's this very, very famous scene in the movie where his girlfriend asks him, she says, why are you working so hard? Like, why are you working so hard to win this gold medal? And a very famous line, he says, when that gun goes off, I've got 10 seconds. When that starting pistol goes off, I've got 10 se- seconds to justify my existence. I want to feel significant. I want to feel like I matter. And if I win this, win this race, then I matter. Then I'm significant. And in his case, he'd chosen a gold medal. And if you remember the movie in its true and real life, uh, there's a huge letdown after that. Now, here's the point. Both modern and traditional people are trying to earn their salvation. They're trying to justify their, themselves. And for traditional people, it's trying to satisfy your parents or your community. Modern people are doing this by being transgressive or innovative, we're both trying to, they're both trying to earn their salvation. You have to perform. In a traditional identity, you have to perform to your parents or the society's standards. In modern identity, you have to perform to your own standards. And in some ways, it's harder, right? Because you have to say, well, okay, define myself. Well, who am I? But then you also have to live to the self-professed identity you've chosen. And every day we see people online being called out because they're not living to the identity they've given themselves, right? You say you care about the environment, you're flying your own jet, what are you doing, right? You say you're a vegan, right? You're eating dairy, okay? We saw you here, right? And we post a picture, right? And so here's what you need to understand. Both the modern and traditional way of making your identity are crushing, are crushing because you have to perform. And if you're performing well, Hey, you feel good about yourself. But if you're not performing well, it's awful, right? Is there a better way? Yeah. The gospel stands apart from all other worldviews, all other religions and forms of thinking, because here's why. And only in Christianity do you get your identity that is received and not achieved. This makes it totally unique that your identity is received and it's not achieved. It gives us a unique source of identity, and it gives us a unique shape. Let me talk about the basis for this. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in the city of Corinth, and he says this in his second letter. He says, God made him, speaking of Jesus, God the Father made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now notice this first sentence here, okay? When it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Does that mean that Jesus on the cross became sinful and he became jealous and proud and hateful? No, right? What it's saying is that on the cross, God the Father treated God the Son as if he had done everything we had done. It treated him as if he had been sinful. On the cross, Jesus took our punishment. Now look what it says next. It says, because of that, so that in him, we, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Now, please notice, I'm not you know, defending this, I'm just saying, here's how this works. It's different from any other way to build an identity. When you say, Heavenly Father, forgive me and accept me, not because of anything I have done, but because of what Jesus has done on the cross, in that moment, we become the righteousness of God. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that we all of a sudden become perfect? No, right? If you're married to a Christian, you know that. We don't become perfect. Don't say amen, right? But just as Jesus had never sinned, but was treated as being sinful, and God the Father put upon him all the sins of us, so also we don't automatically become perfect, but God looks at us and treats us as if we had lived the life Jesus had lived, and we'd done everything that Jesus has done, and all of a sudden you're an heir. You're a child of God. It's life-changing. It's astounding, because all of a sudden, now, his opinion of you cannot go up and down based on your performance. Your identity is now based on the performance of Jesus Christ, who lived the life you should have lived, died the death we should have, we, we should have died. That is the basis of our identity. And no other culture, you're not going to find this anywhere else, no other worldview, right? Traditional society says, your family tells you who you are. Modern society says, hey, you, only you can tell you who you are. But in Christi- for Christians, God tells you who you are. He is the one who defines your life. And you receive your identity from what God says about you. God becomes the validator in your life. He tells you who you are. Um, about 25 years ago, when I was in seminary training to be a pastor, and um, the story's going to sound like I'm bragging, and I am a little bit, but don't hold it against me, okay? It's a good, it's a good illustration. <laughs> um, um, but I studied under a, just a brilliant human being, just a guy I admired so much. He taught me a number of classes. He was an excellent systematic theologian. He had all these published books that even my favorite authors quoted 
my faculty advisor. So I just had so much respect for this guy. He's a teacher and a scholar. And he graded one of my papers. And as I got it back, he wrote on the top of my paper, hey, may I have permission to make a copy of your, your paper for my records and for my study? And I'm like, yeah, you want a copy of my paper, right? As if. But it was like this wow moment, right? I was on cloud nine and, and it's like it affirmed my academic pursuits. And the reason was it lifted me up because in the words of J.R.R. Tolkien, the praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. That's the best thing you can have. It's above all rewards. Like if someone you don't really respect says you're great, that's okay, right? Someone you think's a bit of a fool says you're great, okay, right? But if someone you respect praises you, wow, uh, there, there's nothing like being adored by someone you adore. And, and someone that you really adore says, I love your art. What, you know? Or I love the business you've built. Or uh, they compliment your cooking. It just goes right through you, right? But let me ask you this. What if it's God affirming your life? What if the almighty God, the creator of the universe, looks at you and says, I choose you. I would choose you all over again. And according to the Bible, when you were in Jesus Christ, God looks at you the only person, the only being whose opinion counts and he finds you more precious than all the riches in the entire world. And the degree that that sinks in, that is the most stable source of identity that you will ever get in life. Because the praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. The praiseworthy one is affirming and accepting you. Man, the Christian source of identity is totally unique, but it's also unique in its shape, right? the way it looks and takes form. And here's why. In Christianity, you get the only identity that's received, not achieved. It's a gift of grace. We don't deserve it, but we get it. And so what happens, this is wonderful, at the same time, it humbles you to the dirt and it lifts you to the sky all at once, right? And when it takes shape in our life, you realize this is, a, I'm loved, but it's not because of anything I've done. And it, it, it esteems you and it humbles you all at once. And at the same time, in lives of Christians who are working this into their life and building their identity upon this, it gives you a boldness and a humility at the same time. Because your identity is received. It is not achieved. Do you understand the power of this? Do you understand the power of this? That, that what it looks like in your life is I don't need to build myself up with another achievement or another purchase. I don't have to compare myself to other people. I don't have to criticize other people to make myself feel good. I can actually hear their criticism without it destroying me because my identity is not based on your opinion of me. My identity is based on God's opinion of me. And there's a boldness and humility together. Only in Jesus do you get the verdict on your life before the performance of your life. You understand that? Even if you're here and you're not a Christian, maybe you're an atheist, you say, well, I want to be a good person. Well, how do you know how good is enough? And you don't get, you have to wait till the end of your life to get the verdict. But in Christianity, you get the verdict on your life before the performance of your life. Some of you will remember a few summers ago, two summers ago, I think it was, we interviewed Eric Fair on our stage, NHL player. He was going to his church. And um, if you're an NHL player, if you're a pro athlete, it's the ultimate meritocracy. You are valued based on what you do. And I said to him, how does that work for you? And he said, I was so lucky to have a chaplain who all my years playing for the Wheat Kings, Brian Wheat Kings said, you are not valued on how many goals you score. You're valued because you are Eric Fair, child of God, loved by God. That is an incredible basis for identity. You're not valued on how good you do in school. You're not necessarily valued on how high you climb in your business. Your worth was established on Good Friday. Jesus going to the cross. And the one whose only opinion matters looks at you and says, you are a child of the most high God. That's an identity that doesn't crush you. And it doesn't lead you to crush or exclude others. And you don't get it anywhere else. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, we just come before you and confess that we're not very good at this. And sometimes we have so often bought into the messages of our culture that value us based on our opinion or our parents' opinion or uh, so many things. And so we just come to you in humility with open hands and we say, lead us into better ways. Lead us into everlasting life, we pray. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for this cross that forever said that we are great sinners, that nothing less than the death of God would save us. But we're also greatly loved. And you loved us enough to go to the cross. And I pray that that would sink into our lives. Show us how to build our identities upon your love for us. 
We need this so desperately in a world that gives us messages that just don't work. And so would you lead us on? And as the psalm writer said, would you lead us to the rock that is higher, the rock that is higher than myself, to base our identities upon you, we pray. Amen. Hey, we're gonna leave you with a song. I was uh, at a pastor's retreat this summer, and this song, someone just put it on to the speakers over breakfast, and it just hit me. And uh, I hope you enjoy this and what it says about our identity as much as I do.
what if that became the basis of your identity? It's based on the love of God. That would give you a rock solid basis that nothing could shake. If God's stirring your heart, take action. Do what you need to do to, to take down some old ways of thinking, to, to put your hope in Him again. See what it does in your life. Thank you so much for joining us. We invite you back next week for part two of the series. If you need anything, there's people at guest services. Our prayer team is down here at the front. I want you to go in the great hope and joy that is ours as followers of the risen Jesus Christ. Thanks so much, everyone.